Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ACF Chess Forum. I'm thrilled to have you all here with us today for the highly anticipated webinar on July's trend, the global pantry. I'm Chef Christopher Tanner, the Executive Director of the American Culinary Federation. Today, we'll delve into the fascinating world of sourcing food from around the globe, a topic that's incredibly relevant and vital to our industry. At the ACF, we are committed to bringing you the cutting edge information and insights from the best in the business, and today is no exception. We have an exceptional lineup of experts who will share their knowledge and experiences with you, our valued leaders in the food service industry. Before we dive in, a few housekeeping notes. We'll be answering as many of your questions as possible during the presentation. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and utilize the Q&A function at any time during the session to pose your questions to our speakers. We want this to be an interactive and engaging session, so don't hesitate to get involved. To kick things off, let's get the chat buzzing by sharing where you're tuning in from today. We'd love to hear to see, see what the first locations and backgrounds of our ACF community. Now let's talk about the global pantry trend. The trend is all about exploring and integrating diverse ingredients and culinary techniques from around the world into our kitchens. It's about broadening our culinary horizons, sourcing unique products, and creating innovative dishes that ex excite and expire. The global pantry trend encourages chefs to look beyond traditional boundaries and incorporate exotic ingredients that can reinvent dishes or enhance flavors in new and unique ways. Think about the umami-rich depth of Japanese miso in a classic French beurre blanc, or the vibrant citrusy kick of yuzu added to adding a twist or tra traditional lemon tart. Imagine the smoky allure of Spanish pimenton elevating a simple roasted chicken or earthy fragrant notes of Ethiopian berber, transforming a familiar beef stew into something extraordinary. By embracing these global ingredients, we are not only expanding our culinary repertoire, but also offering guests a dining experience that's truly unique and memorable. This trend is about celebrating diversity in our food, and it's a fantastic way to keep our menus fresh, exciting, and relevant. All right, let's meet our today's presenters. Our first presenter is Jim McCain. Jim joined the Savior team in 2022, bringing with him impressive 30 years of experience in the food service industry. His extensive background in culinary arts, sales, and training makes him a valuable asset to the team. Jim and his wife, Kathy, reside in Omaha, Nebraska, and have two adult daughters. Out, outside of work, they enjoy Nebraska athletic events, various art organizations, and above all, traveling. Jim's favorite destinations include Rome, Paris, and Barcelona. As a chef, Jim is passionate about creating and enjoying foods from various ethnic backgrounds, with wood fire pizza being his specialty. Next up, we have Steve... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to screw up your name, Steve. I'm sorry. De Marinas. Steve has been in the food service industry for 28 years and joined, joined the uh, Saver team in 2019. A Boston native, Steve is a proud father of two young men and enjoys spending time at the beach with his wife. His favorite food to cook at home is perfectly grilled New York strip steak, and he has a deep appreciation for Italian cuisine. Steve operates remotely from his home in Hampstead, North Carolina. Our third presenter is Along Ling. Along is uh, responsible for managing a significant portion of Saver's pro product offering. She tirelessly searches the globe for the right uh, for the right items to add to the Saver pantry. Works closely with vendors throughout the buying process and oversees inventory sales growth. Along Along brings a decade of food service industry experience to the team. She has a love for Taiwanese cuisine and a nod to her heritage. And Tex-Mex, a favor from her time in Texas. She works re uh, remotely from her home in Dallas, Texas. Lastly, we have Joe, Joe Fortner. Joe recently joined the Savour team and is focused on managing products from South America and Europe. He spent the previous 10 years at Dot Foods and business development, working with supplier partners and handling domestic commodity offerings. Joe and his wife, Amanda, live in St. Louis area with their twins, Reed and Kinley. Most of Joe's free time is spent at various sport, sport venues, coaching or watching his kids play. He has a broad culinary palate with a particular fondness for seafood, Joe operates out of Savers' corporate office in Chesterfield, Missouri. At this time, I'm excited to pass the presentation over to Jim. Jim, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, we at Saver Imports are very happy to join you today to, to, to talk about uh, what it is we do and especially how that how that um, ties into your, your theme today of global sourcing. That is at the root of what we do. So I want to make sure that my presentation is sharing here. Let me get this PowerPoint up. Can uh, I'm going to assume you can all see my screen. Very good. So Saver Imports, this may seem a little, uh, we're going to take this a little backwards. We were actually formed 
to be a solution of how to get these world sourced foods to the American table. So we at Saver Imports are a wholly owned subsidiary of Dot Foods. And for those of you that may or may not know who Dot Foods is, uh, Dot is the nation's largest redistributor of foods to the American food service environment. So what that means is if a distributor, be that a large corporate distributor or a small independent distributor, needs to buy product from a manufacturer, there are times where it doesn't make sense for them to order that product directly from the manufacturer because the minimums can be prohibiting. Uh, often those minimums that used to be 2,500 pounds direct are now 10,000 pounds direct or more. So what Dot Foods does as a redistributor is bundles all those products together. So Dot Foods has over a thousand suppliers in their warehouse every day, and they distribute to over 90% of food service distributors every week. So any distributor in the United States can order a mixture of products. They can have those products blended together. The formation of Saver Imports about 12 years ago came with that distributor partners were asking for years of DOT saying, you're our last mile solution. We're how you are supposed to help us with these hard to buy items so where we can't meet minimums, imports. Where, how can we get imports? So after a, what sounds like countless years of study, DOT came to the conclusion to form their own company. So Saver Imports was born. And now 12 years later, we're a staff of 22. We're bringing in products from uh, around the world, I think 23 sourcing countries. Joe and Elong can kind of chime in with that uh, and get a little more clear on that later. But we're bringing those products and stocking them all at Dot Foods, meaning that any distributor can order our products from one case to one truckload. We try to make things accessible. We were formed to be a solution. So our portfolio uh, as it says here, since 2011, created to be a, an answer to inefficient supply chain, 23 sourcing countries. We're both trend-driven and um, global environment-driven. Elong and Joe will get into how we source a product, why we source a product. Uh, our products are in all temperature classes, so we do frozen, dry, and refrigerated products. And our product line has changed somewhat, and we'll get into that a little bit, that now in addition to some of the pantry items you think of with an importer, and we'll get to those in a minute, we also do a lot of value-added items where, especially in a post-pandemic world, um, we have some items that are just helping maybe take a knife out of their hand for a little bit of time or saving a bit of time. So... We think about the menu, obviously we're very data-driven at Saver Imports, and most of the data tells us that there are three sort of culinary trends that are driving the American menu, certainly not limited to these three cuisines, but these three cuisines do take up a lot of space. And so we focus our offering to meet the needs of, of in not only these three cuisines, but uh, chief among these. So Asian cuisine, of course, with uh, Chinese food leading the way in terms of um, restaurants in the United States, Japanese, Korean, Asian fusion has become very popular. Um, Latin cuisine has also really taken over the American menu. So we're sourcing products to meet the needs of that. Those sort of fusion cuisines are also stepping in. And Mediterranean remains very strong on American menus, be that pasta, pizza, um, all the things with that. So um, we're we're very data driven, so we'll get into some. You know, we'll talk about how, why we bring in these products in just a moment. So we like to think of it. Um, we often hear supply and demand, and I like to reverse it and think and think demand and supply. So the demand is there. The palate has changed. American restaurants and American diners are eating a far more diverse. Uh, array of foods than they have at any time in our history. Um, and at the same time that that's happening with an expanded palate, labor also remains a real a real issue. I'm not, uh, I'm, there's no news in that for any of you listening to this today, right? So supply, Dot Foods delivers to over 90% of the food service distributors in the United States every week. 
so we can get the product from A to B. Um, we have a full sample program that utilizes FedEx, so we can sample products. Um, we have each as of many or cases, and we'll send them directly to an operator that would like to test our products. Uh, Dot Foods has a wonderful customer service team, so they can be very helpful in helping to nurse a product uh, through your distributor. And whether you need one case or one truckload, uh, Dot Foods and Saver Imports can supply that to you. We, we kind of divide our offering specifically into, in this case, into like two separate areas. One would be the import pantry. So these are the things that you probably think of when you think about an importer, and many of these products are dry. So whether that's artichoke hearts or a variety of olives, uh, because of our trends, we do very authentic Asian sauces from Thailand. Um, we're doing peppers and olive oil and capers and marconas. We do raw grains. We do pre-cooked grains, um, roasted tomatoes, truffle oil, for instance. So we do an imp a, a variety of the import pantry items that you probably associate when you hear the word importer. In prior to and now really driven by uh, in a post-2020 world, many of our items have become uh, labor-saving items. So, for instance, the number one selling item in our line is, uh, is a pre-caramelized onion that ships frozen. So it's, it's a two ingredients, right? It's onions and oil. We don't really want to, we're not ever trying to impart the final plate flavor. We're just trying to provide uh, an item that saves you a little bit of time. So an item like that, or pickled red onions, or pre-roasted Brussels sprouts. Again, these are all just base ingredients. They're not spiced. They're not. We're not adding final plate flavor. We, that's that's the chef's job. We just are in those instances where labor is so tight. We can provide some speed scratch beginnings that allow to just save a little bit of time in the kitchen and keep your quality up. So those labor-saving items have really been taking off for us. Um, global sauces, we continue to um, to expand our line all the time. Um, obviously now to include things like sriracha with the shortages that went there and sambal olik, and we have an excellent sesame oil, for instance. So we, you know, with things like that that we're trying to find always and and find the best food that we can to do that. So that's how we that's how we're on out on the street working with chefs, working with distributors, doing what we can to get these products into American restaurants. And with that, this is a good time to sort of turn that over then to to the kind of core of today, which is what are the factors that are importing bringing these products in from around the world? And with us today, we have two experts uh, along those lines, uh, Ilong Ling and Joe Fortner are uh, the two category managers that really are responsible for buying all of the nearly 350 items that we're bringing in constantly. And so they are both experts in their field in terms of all of the factors that go into buying these products. And those factors are ever increasing. And they'll touch on a few of those today of the of how weather and politics and tariffs and everything affects getting product from country A to the United States. So with that, I will turn things over to Joe Fortner and Elong Ling. Hey, thanks, Jim. Thank you. thank you for that. Sorry, Long. Uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, Christopher, thank you as well. Um, as Christopher mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of my areas pertain to uh, South America and Europe. Um, anywhere items we're talking, such as artichokes, peppers, um, olives, cooking wines, balsamics, uh, those kind of fall into my category, along with like IQF vegetables and fruit. Um, along, you could touch on kind of the areas that you're in. Who gets the sexy European stuff? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I get um, Canada, some part, I've got Peru, um, mostly Asia, um, just all the really hot and humid places. So, but we're, we're, we complement each other on what we do. 
Absolutely. So we're going to start with um, just a little overview on what our process is. Jim, can we go to the next slide? It's, it's exactly as it says, how do we transform an idea into a case? Um, we have a staff of 22. Um, we've got, you know, we've, we've got our chef who does the culinary and trends. Jim, is there another? Yep. Thank you. So we, we have this idea and we'll, we'll get into how we come up with these ideas. We'll just, you know, have an idea uh, and it can be driven from customers, could be driven from what we do on a daily basis. So once we get that idea, we've got to formulate, well, who who can be our our nominated supplier that we work with, manufacturer? Um, there's a extensive vetting process um, on the on the legal side um, and on the FSQA side, food safety quality assurance. And then after that, we've got to design the packaging and we've got to do a number of internal things, pricing, seeing how the how to price it within the market that makes it fair and accessible. Um, after that, we go into, we place the order. We've got to get the product um, on the water over here. And then it goes into our distribution for our sales team. Um, luckily with DOT, we, have an extensive network um, in in country that helps us with a lot of the logistics in in country, um, and we've got this wonderful team of of sales and, and sourcing support um, that help us with every single step of the way. It's a very cohesive um, and collaborative environment that we've got on this team. So I've got to do a little shout out for our team, um, and it it's not without uh, bumps. There are a lot of um, there are lots of cooks in the kitchen constantly. Um, we debate very passionately about whether um, this is this right. We even debate pack sizes, um, packaging. We debate everything, but our our whole process is it's we've got to bring something in that makes sense and that's going to be a, sol a problem solver solution for the end user. And I think some of the biggest things about that is, is the time frame it can take on some of these ideas and the suppliers. Um, some can launch quicker than others. Other ideas take a while just in the ideation of it, figuring it out. So there's different aspects to it depending on the item. And then when you're talking about importing something over the water, obviously there's a whole other time frame put into that as well. Um, so I think that's another aspect that we have to discuss quite a bit. And then, you know, we're not dealing with, I would say, I mean, most most everybody is English speaking, but then, you know, there, there are lots of these little minute details that you're dealing with people that English is not the first language. Yes. And so there's and there's interpretations on things as, you know, we we have an idea in the U.S. on what a brown corrugate looks like. Um, that is not the same interpretation around the world. So it's 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 things that that you when you see that final box in your hands, there's a lot of thought that went into that. It's not just, you know, poof, it, it's done. It's it's quite extensive. Shall you good with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Then I good think, to move? Go ahead. Yeah, I think if you want to go to the next slide, Jim, you know, there are many things that go into how we source product. Um, there are decisions that have to be made no different than the standard list that Alon just shared, but there's also just ideas that you have to come up with. And, you know, we at Saver err toward the size of quality. Um, we want our product to be of the highest quality. Um, so we try not to find ourselves too price driven. We don't, we don't play in that world a whole lot. Uh, we want to work with strategic partners that have high quality products. But at the end of the day, each day, I think, Jim, you can hit another button there and have more show up. But there, there's more stuff that happens in a given day, more issues or items that you simply can't control when you wake up in the morning. And uh, that's kind of what makes the job unique. 
but it also makes it stressful. And uh, as you guys deal with it on your end as well, you know, it starts with us. So a lot of those issues are things that you can't control, whether it is dealing with mother nature, like we have in the past year or two in countries like Peru, dealing with El Nino, um, mangoes have been hard to get, um, peppers, red peppers, suppliers have had issues constantly. We've had shortages. Um, anything that goes into a drought can affect anything that happens elsewhere. Um, just because it happens in one place doesn't mean it doesn't affect other items. Um, and then also you do get in, like Jim mentioned earlier, more into political issues, war issues. Um, you, you run into issues such as, uh, say, the Suez Canal, where items are delayed through there. They're having issues. And so containers are now needing to go around Africa at times, which adds time, which but not only does that delay the item that's on that container, but that container was expected to be somewhere else. So now it just is a snowball effect of where other items are going to be. And now those are running behind too. So one domino can mess up a lot of things that happen logistically, especially over the water and overseas where we don't have that much control. And then another decision that has to be debated constantly and figured out where are you going to source the product from, not only from quality, but also what is the economic issues that are going on there, such as tariffs, duties, are they a free trade country with the U.S.? What are the other aspects that we have to deal with on a daily basis to make that decision? You know, I always think of whether Spain has an unbelievable artichoke, um, Peru does a good artichoke, you have to draw that line between do you want $6 more for an unbelievable artichoke just due to a tariff um, or a duty? I mean, those are things that you have to beat up and figure out. So you constantly have to find a supplier you're comfortable with, and hopefully you find one in the area that is less expensive, but sometimes we don't. And uh, we will have to make that transition. So all of those things that happen really weren't our decision to make a change. Um, you know, some of it's forced and there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, uh, Jim, I think there might even be more on this slide, oh, it's, uh, it's okay. some photos, oh. but, but those are some of the issues we've had to deal with just throughout a given year. Um, I don't know if you have things to add. At, at its core, we do, um, we do prefer to do, to, to pick geographies, product in its geography that's that they're indigenous to. Perfect example, quinoa. We we have decided sometimes painfully that you know we we prefer the Andean um, region uh, on raw materials because that's where it's indigenous to. So we source strictly out of Peru, and that means we you know we go as far as to spec um, certain regions, um, colors and and. Um, humidity level and all of that um, just because that's what we believe presents as the best for quinoa and uh, it, it's 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 all it's sometimes a painful decision because you, we could be facing shorts and we have to make other decisions on you know what's depending on how long the pain is going to last we'll make inventory decisions and then we might consider other origins you know we that's we've always got to have backups but you know, at its core, we've got to, we try to stay true to the ingredient in its history. Um, I mean, another one, edamame, it's Chinese in origin, but believe it or not, I've seen edamame being grown in Romania. I looked at it, I looked at it, and I kind of tilted my head, um, but I mean, how is the consumer going to feel about a U.S. consumer going to feel about edamame grown from Romania? Maybe it's accepted in, in Europe, but as far as the U.S., if they saw edamame and it had the product of, of Romania, they'd be looking at us like, do you all know what you're doing? So it's those are those are little quirks in what we do and all the all these little details that play into decisions that we make. And I think to tag along with that, when you talk about countries and where items are from, 
um, I'm sure from more familiar that more and more products are coming from Egypt. And Egypt is, they grow everything there. They can grow anything there. Um, and it's usually pretty cost effective. Uh, you know, I think one of the debates, you know, we sliced ripe olives. You know, we were using a Morocco supplier, had issues there. It was going to be a long-term problem, still is, and for numerous reasons. Uh, but it was a debate. Do you go to the higher quality of which I think it would be Spanish or, you know, can you find an Egyptian supply that's suitable? And at the end of the day, we erred towards Spain because it was going to be a long term move for us and our label. So I think those are things you debate because even though there's certain suppliers that can give a certain area a bad name, I think that happens at times. And I think there are some items that we we could pull out of a country like Egypt and we do a couple, but those are things that you have to monitor and be very close. Um, whether it's checking on the USDA reports on, um, you know, pesticides in Egypt's a touchy button and having issues from suppliers, um, hasn't happened with anyone we've worked with, but you never know, but it's still kind of a black eye for that area. If, if you think about it. So those are other things that kind of go into those decisions. Or clear cut, it, we you know we 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 think it should be we we approach things as that, but we also you know, you know we're prepared for things just to, to have contingencies, and we keep our options open. We may not always pull the trigger on it, but we do keep our options open and and try and understand where the market's moving, where the crops are moving, and what options there are. Because you know it's it is it's worse to know when there's a crop failure or you're notified of a crop failure and what do you what's the decision going to be? Are we going to choose to out customers for six months or do we scramble and, and you know do we adopt a a different country of origin? It's just that's that's our life. That's how we live our every day. Yeah. And it, I yeah, and I think that's also important to the fact of why we vet out suppliers so like it takes a while, simply because we want to be with a partner that can help us with that information. Um, I don't care if it's bad news. I just want the news, you know. So right. I think that's the biggest thing is if you have suppliers that are open and uh, honest about situations, uh, I think that's the only way to go about this. So. You know, there's been times over my last, you know, first full year being here at Saver where you just find people you become more comfortable with and you and you trust them more on the information they're telling you. With the number of items Jim said we carry, you can only be an expert on so many like I'm not. I'm only as good as my suppliers I work with and the information they share with me. I mean, they're the ones on the ground there and in, in doing things. So, you know, that's the the part that always has to be considered. Long, would you share, I think it's a, just an interesting, along these lines, would you just kind of briefly share what happened with anchovies last year? El Nino, which is uh, which everybody has been blaming for droughts and too much rainfall. Um, El Nino was blamed for, there was either overfishing of little anchovies, um, anchovy fish, um, or El Nino caused a disturbance and they weren't growing um, to uh, the minimum size for processing. So our product is processed out of Morocco, but they use Peruvian raw materials. Um, so basically, the Peruvian government put a stop to fishing their anchovies and um, our producer, our, our partner in Morocco, had to scramble and look for other raw materials um, out of Spain, out of the Mediterranean, which is going to be a higher cost. Um, but there was a there was a time where we flat out could not get any raw materials. It just they had to because once you fish them, you do have to salt them, um, and that's a several month process. So it's not like it's you know, you fish them and they go in, they've got to ferment. Um, so, the, you know, of course, that creates panic throughout the, the industry. Everybody's doing an, you know, a, an inventory grab, which is always so much fun. 
Um, so we, th there is also, there's also some thought of the product going, we're changing the oil. Um, we do a strictly 100% olive oil blend. It, you know, in olives, uh, there was a problem. Joe was, Joe was living through the olive and olive oil crisis uh, last year. And that, you know, that's an, also another decision. Like, do we want to continue to pay um, the elevated olive oil prices? Um, but we, we just, you know, we stay true to what we think should be the quality of a product. And we were out for a few months and it was painful. Um, but we're back in business. So it, it's, you know, you don't think about El Nino affecting little anchovies in Peru. You don't think about that when you're having your Caesar, but that's what happens. <laughs> Along. Um, and Joe, if I may, I think it also is kind of helpful to this whole sort of sourcing thing about how we pick a partner. Could you just give a brief overview of how we brought on our mole supplier from Oaxaca, Mexico? Uh, sure. Uh some of that happened before I was here. Um, our president, uh, director, uh, found them at a food show and basically walked by and thought it was a fantastic product. Um, however, uh, no certifications, anything like that. And fast forward two years later, the certification was received. And we went down. One of my first trips in this position was down there to see their facility. Um, it was great. Product's great. Um, good people. And I think that, you know, having that product and being able to bring it in for a supplier like that is, it, it's a great partnership. And, you know, you want to see an item like that grow. And, you know, it's an item that has 28 plus ingredients in it that, you know, you talked about earlier, the potential of having, we want to find like labor savers and things like that for our customers. Um, I think that's a great representation of kind of where the trends are on food. And uh, plus the trip to Oaxaca was fantastic, by the way. I'll throw that out there. I recommend it to anyone. Um, we had a great, great meals. Everything down there, the environment is very food oriented. And uh, it was, uh, but I think those items and just finding that supplier, like we talk about, it wasn't necessarily a trend back there. Back then it was just an item that, looked good at a show and you know you go to a show and you hope to find an item like that really you know and i think that was probably the biggest thing that came from that it's one of those and we put a lot of marketing behind it and things like that so it's it's exciting when you have an item like that you i i, I love how they came to be a supplier partner of ours mm -hmm. do you have another slide yeah uh and then you can go one more to Jim. I think the, uh, you know, I think when you look at it and we can touch on this and, and what kind of makes us different, it's Sabre. We want to say, you know, it, our competitive advantage, I mean, working with DOT, not only can we get product here overseas, we work on that aspect like me and Along just touched on. But once it's here, we're able to handle that product, you know, with uh, 2,000 trailer trucks, over 2,000 with 13 DCs across the country. Um, we also have terminals throughout the country we use to get products like Jim referenced. You know, a customer can literally get one case within a two to three day lead time on anything stocked. Um, you know, that is an advantage that we have that I can kind of almost not worry about that aspect when it, when it gets here, you know? Uh, so that's a, that's a good feeling to have um, on our end. And uh, Alon, if you want to touch on the safety or quality. Okay. So we, that is a huge, huge advantage in, in, in dealing with us because we do have a extensive food safety and quality assurance program. Um, you know, we, FISMA, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, it kind of changed everything for how people bring into product into the country legally, um, you know, without changing their LLC every two years. Um, yes, that was shade. I'm sorry. You might want to cut that out. But um, we, uh, so as far as our food safety, we require um, a 
a GFSI audit scheme. It's a global food safety initiative. And we also, that that is an annual audit that every facility that we deal with um, needs to complete. They've got to also submit their report, their audit report, as well as their certificate, which our food safety quality assurance manager, she verifies that. She goes and she she doesn't just accept what they turn into us. She verifies that against other databases just to make sure they're above board because there are also um, forgeries of those certificates out there. That's more common than you think. Um, in addition to that, we require a, the, the there's documents that have to be renewed every three years and that's their food defense plan, food safety plan, quality manual, um, recall traceability program, supplier management and approval program. So we, we're very, very serious about that. This is, you know, it's it's legal, but it's also safe. It's a safety issue. We don't want to, we don't want to harm anyone. We we want to make sure that it's safe for you and the quality is good. Um, in addition to the legal and safety issues, we we also checked the um, we regularly audit our items. And also we always audit the first incoming PO because what you look at as a bench sample may be completely different than what you get as a production item. So we that's that's a part of our process that we uh, observe every time. Um, anything to add to that, Joe, on the food safety? No, I think there's the, the point there, it, it kind of goes back to the mole. There's items that we really like or, or want to work with, but we simply can't because we can't get the right legal documents or the right safety information together. And if that's the case, we have to kind of move on and um, it's just not gonna, you know, nobody squeaks through, as you say. So, they you don't. know, that's the way we look at it. We just can't partner with someone that, that doesn't have that information. There are conversations that you'll have um, when you first meet some uh, a potential supplier and um, they'll, they'll nod yes to everything you're saying, you're asking. Um, but when you actually ask them to turn over the documents, it is crickets. And it's like, okay, that's fine. If you don't have it, it's fine. But you know, you're right. you're just you're not getting in with these documents. Right. We're pretty strict about things like that. So yes. It says a lot that we're a team of 22 people and three of them are solely F FSQA, right? You know, so we're we're really committed to food safety. Um, another thing that makes us really strong is the culinary innovations. Um, we have corporate chef, Don Turley, and he, he owns this portion and we, we all have input. Um, we debate with him, all of us debate with him. Um, he's very, very particular about formulations and, um, and it, it's it's been painful sometimes, but he's usually correct in his his request for revisions. But it's 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 nice to have somebody. He he does have the experience. You know, he was with other national chains prior prior to this. Um, but he's it, it's it's good to have a culinary resource that I, I we can rely on, and to help us make these decisions um and he's out in front of customers a lot too so he knows what the customer is wanting it's not just about what is the trend but it's got to make sense you know it's got to be usable for the end user and and anybody else and it's also important that not only the innovation part and the revisions he'll work on to get an item just right but he's also there for us when we want to change an item that's more you know change a caper or change anything like that. I mean, we have quarterly cuttings uh, to review items, to sample before we just say, oh, this price on sliced banana pepper rings is better. Um, this supplier is good. You know, we want to check those products and Don really helps us with that. And, uh, you know, the whole team there in the culinary world there, it helps tremendously to have. Um, so you're not, not chasing something you shouldn't be chasing anyway. We're not afraid to revise something if it improves the pro the product. I mean, it's it's a 
painful for marketing. It's painful for us, but we are not afraid to make those changes if the end result is better. And then another aspect that we spend a lot of time on is sustainability. Uh, you know, more and more sustainability gets talked about. And I think we've seen it where, you know, we're trying to get people to move more or they're wanting us to move more into pouches instead of cans. We have a lot of items that we've moved into pouches, anything from, you know, the quinoa there, or artichokes, or uh, we're working on dried mushrooms now, which is an exciting item. So there's a lot of items we've used to do that with. So you're trying to get more sustainable with a, at the same time without losing quality of the product um, because there is a big difference there and how that product might sit in brine if it's in a bag and only half of it's covered where in a gallon it's covered the whole time. That makes for a different product after a certain amount of time. Um, so I think that's a lot of stuff that we're working towards for customers, uh, for end users. Um, you know, it goes right along with the labor savers and things like that. If we can get, you know, we, we realize national accounts don't want glass in the back of their kitchen. Um, you know, we want to try to move items that direction where we're not that way. Um, and, and so far we've had a lot of success there, but as I touched with the long earlier, sometimes we have an idea and sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, but, you know, at least you're trying to think of different items and the way we could go about it. Hey, one thing I just want to add is, um, you know, quality, as I said, is, is the key thing for us, but we also try to, we're not play, uh, complacent with it. So FSQA is looking, pulling individual cases of existing items that we've been selling for a while, make sure it meets our spec, our chefs doing the same thing, because even though we've developed really good partnerships with these suppliers, things happen. And we got to make sure that that quality uh, meets meets our customers' expectations. So, so we make a, a, a strong effort to make sure we're evaluating products cons consistently to make sure it, it hits that quality mark. So, so the new items coming up. Mm -hmm. I can, touch I can touch a few of mine, uh, you know, the uh, caramelized uh, piquillo and jalapeno pepper jams. We're also working on a chef stable caramelized onion with the same customer or same supplier. Um, but a couple other items that we're really excited about that we're working on right now to bring in our Australian finger limes. They're IQF individual. Uh, very exciting to be used on. Um, seafood, oysters, also you can put them in drinks and they, uh, with sparkling water, champagne, uh, very exciting items, four different varieties. Um, and then we will be the exclusive supplier of those. And then we've also been working on finally getting clams on board, whether those be sea, ocean clams, clam juice, um, things like that. Those are all in the uh, um, onboarding stage now as, as we speak. I've, I've got the duck cells, the Indian and Thai sauces. The duck cell I saw um, a while back and I just fell in love with it. I mean, it's, it, um, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know how it's going to do, but it's such a delicious item. Um, it's, it's in a retort pouch and I think it's, it's a labor saver. Right. You don't have to chop anything up. You don't have to caramelize anything. It is ready to use. Um, and I hope it's is successful because it is delicious. Um, that's that's where this is where I get in trouble is, you know, we, we fall in love with items and we hope it works. Um, you know, remains to be seen. Um, and the supplier, you want it to work for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Indian sauces and. Indian sauce, Indian, the Indian cuisine, it's, it's getting, it's exploding. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting more and more in popularity. Um, we are going to be bringing in some sauces that are speed scratch and, and quite approachable, but maintains the authenticity where we hope it does um, to Indian cuisine. And Thai, Thai sauces, they've, you know, things like curries and, 
sweet chili, sriracha, all of that. Sriracha, yes, is a, it is a Thai origin product. Um, those are staples, but we are going to be adding slight twists to them to make them refreshed and innovative. So hopefully we can thrill you with our coming items. Jim? Friends? I think these go back to you, Jim. Okay. So I... When we're talking about bringing in products, we talk about, you know, so Elong and Joe were uh, very eloquently talking about all the factors that go into play about, you know, how we can pick a partner, how we can pick that region, what we can do with that. But we also have to be very aware of trend. So we're all, uh, there are uh, many culinary backgrounds on our team. We're all <laughs> spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of foods. Uh, all the time. So we're we're trying to tap into all the data sources. We're we're all kind of plugged into all of the data sources that are available in the industry, as well as um the travel and trade shows and everything to go out and see what's next, what what the next thing is. Um we're we're with everyone that uh Chefs Don's three top trends this year are complex spicy flavors. So things like Calabrians, global spice blends, our mole, those are all driven, you know, those are all purposeful to that we think complex spicy flavors are where the customer lives right now. The second trend we're sort of, that we're uh, sort of ideating to this year is nostalgia you know new spins on old classics so be that something as simple as loaded fries with you know global ingredients like elote or queso um swapping out an expected ingredient with a new take like a roasted poblano in place of a bell pepper um and then the complexity of flavor and tender crisp texture of roasted vegetables so we end up doing quite a bit of some fire roasted vegetables um, that are IQF, many of them are ready to eat. And anything in our line that carries that RTE banner means that it's gone through a third-party bacteria kill so that you can literally thaw it and, and serve it. So like a roasted corn, like a roasted poblano. So those are those are trends that, that our product offering right now is geared toward. We're putting products where our ideation is, right? So um, those are trends that we're chasing. It's it's an interesting thing that, so for us to bring in a product, obviously, you know, like, so this, we'll take a gamble on, okay, we believe in these trends, so we're going to bring in products to support the trend. But in some of the ideation things that we do, um, we're always looking, you know, there's always questions about, well, we think this is really cool, but could we do this? Is there is it viable? So we're often asking a viability question. And to that end, I'll share something with you that we call the flavor vault. And um, in the flavor vault, it's we put some of the items that were on the previous screen, like duck cells or uh, like a piquillo jam or things like that. And we're asking chefs their opinion, right? So we'll provide a sample and we're asking, what do you think? <laughs> you know, is this a viable item? So we can certainly get Flavor Vault information to you if any of you uh, like to be guinea pigs on on some new items. We can we can certainly travel down that path. So that sort of ends the the formal presentation that we have for you today. We we hope that we've been able to provide you with information that you find valuable about how these products are sourced, all the details that it takes the the legal the weather the political the relationship you know the our industry thank goodness remains a, an industry of relationships right and that's while that's true of um me with the chefs that i work with every day me with the distributors that i work with every day it's also true for uh, roles like Joe and Elong's with the suppliers that they deal with every day. Who can they trust? Who says what? Who who does what they say they're going to do? Who can? Who has the paperwork? Who has the legality? 
all of those factors um, are in play every day behind the scenes of bringing that box on a dot truck to a distributor to take it to a restaurant. So it's a fascinating um, it's a fascinating rodeo that's happening every day, right? So that's our day to day, and it I think it's fairly safe to say that we all really like doing it. So um, with that, we're happy to open things you know back up if Christopher's. Uh, been, I think, maybe fielding some questions. We'd be happy to answer any questions about, you know, what we do or how we get a product, or uh, we'll take your suggestions if there's something new that you're dying for that we need to do, right? Uh, mute. Uh, Jim, there weren't any questions, but there are a lot of comments on how amazing the content was and how much people love it, and uh, I think people really want to get some of your ingredients into their hands to cook with. Um, so of, of, of the ingredients that you have, uh, tell me when you were, what, what's the, the biggest item right now that you have people calling and asking for, but not using in a traditional format. So we're talking about global pantry and really it's, uh, you know, people, one of you mentioned Sriracha earlier, I believe it was along and, uh, Sriracha is, you know, so much different now as that red rooster that we see that's out of California. It's, it's used as ketchup in so many dishes or using esoteric dishes. What's the, what's the next one that, that you find chefs are taking that you would never think there would be the normal uh, normal use for an ingredient. Who's address? Who who's that address? Any, to? any anybody? Any of you? <laughs> we serve Jim. He's in the front line. <laughs> Going to throw him out there. As I'm, uh, I'm, I'm struck lately with um one of our one of our biggest selling i mentioned that the car that the pre-caramelized onions are our number one selling item and they get used a lot of that is because cheeseburgers still rule the menu but those that item gets used in soup that item gets used in dip that item gets used in a lot of different ways as many different ways as there are customers using it we a, a real trend that I see right now is that I get a lot of demand for, I have a lot of people asking me for, uh, is pre-cooked IQF grains. We have we have a pretty broad offering of grains that have been pre-cooked, many of you know, ready to eat again, right? So that can it's gone through a kill step where it could be served cold. And it's purely about operational consistency. And they are blank palate products, right? So that you know, we do one that's a blend that's farro, brown rice, and quinoa that we cleverly call barbecue. And I've seen that recipe as many way. I mean, I've seen it done Asian. I've seen it done Mediterranean. I've seen it done. And people use it as many ways as there are just as there is creativity in the kitchen. So our our food philosophy, if we have one, is to provide the the highest quality ingredient that we can that a chef can then make his own her own and that's really what we do so we don't do anything that's like fully flavored you know like we don't do pre-seasoned grains our grains are our raw palate so, so like that one so like we we often talk about that one plus one take your quinoa blend and add a different flavoring blend or different seasoning to make it the chef's own right exactly or we often refer to that as speed scratch speed where we're not trying well, yeah. to we're not trying to um we love good food right we are restaurant we are restaurant people so we don't we want to just provide a, a solution that maybe speeds things up a little bit but the chef is going to do that so our roasted tomatoes might end up in that uh barbecue grain blend and then maybe it gets protein or maybe it doesn't and maybe it gets za'atar and maybe it doesn't you know whatever flavorings and seasonings and all that is still very much with the chef and i'm also shocked at the um at the requests that we get and how they get used for pre-roasted vegetables like our roasted poblanos and roasted sweet corn um those those items get a lot of play um, well, I'm sure that, again that that roasted sweet corn probably going to a lot of people's uh, elote corn salad or is it uh, exactly the, the right flavors That's, like that yeah right so, so again was, we we do that Griffin. product ready to cook we also do it ready to eat so yeah. an account can just take that add lime cotilla cilantro mayonnaise and there's your elote you know it's boom. Well, there's, 
in even even a quicker steps because I, I you know my background a little bit too prior to coming here i was in commercial food manufacturing so griffith foods we actually came up with a blend that actually did the elote flavor so right. all we had to do is take that seasoning blend put with your corn and put some from um uh cotija cheese in there and you're all set so i love the approach of being able to take the speed scratch and, and bring it into our different chefs across the country because not everyone has the opportunity to make everything from scratch and but they still want to have delicious stuff so uh, I had one last question and then we're going to close out, but the question is, uh, so they want to know how they can become a guinea pig. How, how do, uh, how do, how do, uh, obviously you've got dot foods, but, um, what are some other ways for, uh, for chefs and, and restaurant tours to reach out to you to get some, uh, some of the products? If you, if you go to our website, which I'll, I'll share it into the chat here in a moment, but it's www.saverimports.com. And on that website, you, there's a link for our team. And our contact information, email addresses, and our territories are listed there. So like, for instance, my role primarily is in the kind of upper Midwest, the Rust Belt and the Plains. But I have counterparts on the West Coast, on the East Coast. We have national account managers uh, that handle the whole country. So we have sales team that are kind of assigned to regions. We all help each other and do everything. But our email addresses, our contact information is all on the website. So if if you're if you'd like a sample of a product, if you'd like to try anything of ours or whatever, we're in. We'll we'll send it to you. Um, and we're a young enough company that we really believe in our food. We have to, right? Um, Joe and Elong aren't kidding about trying to source the best stuff we can get, and we're very willing to kind of put that to the test, right? So. Um, I'll put the website in the chat so that it's saved into the presentation. And then if you go to our team there, you can, you'll be able to reach the contact information of our entire sales force that would be happily answer any question for you. Also, all of our products are on that website. Um, everything that we do, if you go to our products, you can see it's a public facing website and you can see all roughly 350 items that we're doing right now. Fantastic. Brittany's posted to the uh, the website for all of you. Uh, so you're able to see that. And uh, Jim, I, I greatly appreciate you and, and along Steve and Joe as well. Thank you for all the time and the enlightening presentation. Truly awesome. Love all these ingredients. And I know the chefs, uh, you know, for global sourcing, when many of us started off in the industry, we didn't have a lot of these available to us. And I think the chefs here, uh, you know, being able to get that directly from you is going to really change a lot of the plates for uh, as we continue to go forward. So uh, as we wrap up, I'd like to remind everyone to keep an eye out for the survey you'll receive in the next day or so. Completing the survey is essential to earn your continuing education hours from uh, being part of this video. Uh, I want to thank Jim along, Steve and Joe for the enlightened presentation. Truly, it was uh, a joy to be part of uh, having you part of our, our webinar program. Uh, we're eagerly, eagerly looking forward to seeing all of you at the ACF National Convention in Phoenix from July 14th to 17th. This is set to be the premier culinary education and event of the year. I will tell you, I'm looking at my calendar six days till I get to check in for my flight. So some of you have a little bit more. I'm going to be there before you so we can get ready for the convention. You guys have great learning opportunities, networking, inspiration. This is going to be one of the first conventions in a long time where all of our member, all of our presentations are done by our members. You're really going to want to be there. You're going to really enjoy it. For more information on upcoming webinars and details about the convention I just mentioned, please visit acfchefs.org. Click on the events tab. And on behalf of the ACF National Office, I want to thank you again to the presenters for the contributions today. And thank you all, you members, for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July. Happy 4th of July.